populations of this porcupine, I'm focusing on the ones in Rhode Island, of course, but uh, they, they do stem from one common ancestor. The other one is found at Torrey Pine State National Reserve in San Diego. And they're, uh, they've been separated long enough to, to the point where they're now genetically distinct. And you can even tell uh, by, by looking at the trees of which source it's from. So these are the only two spots in the world where, this, where these trees are found naturally. They're, they're ornamental trees. Some people have them in their backyards or some have carpentry, but these are the, you could say, the sources of these two trees. The background uh, on the species. So the population in San Diego has been protected since 1885 versus the, the island population was not, has not been protected, you could say effectively, maybe until 2011 or so. The island was purchased in the, in the 1980s, but there was introduced grazers there browsing on these plants up until effectively 2011. So as far as previous data goes, the mainland population has been thoroughly studied. Uh, a, uh, a study was done in 2010 where they counted every tree. They can tell you that there's 5,394 trees. In, uh, in the mainland, they, they broke down the, the sizes of the trees, including the ages, and did a pretty thorough job of that. But for the, the trees on the island, not as much data was collected. There's been some, some studies, but nothing as thorough as what happened at uh, Torrey Pine City National Reserve. So that led us into our, our first question, is what is the uh, Santa Rosa Island and Torrey Pine population? So our, our first, the very first thing we began with was how many trees are out there? And so a previous account said there's an estimated around 2,000, so I thought I, I can count 2,000 trees, it should be simple enough. And uh, so the protocol is to walk up to a tree, measure the diameter of breast height, count how many stems it has, what's the overall health, so we give a health classification for it, how many juveniles are underneath the tree, and then move on to the next one. We also wanted to, uh, for the distribution, if any of you have been to the island or seen a map, all these trees are tucked away in a small pocket of the island. The island's pretty, pretty large, but yeah, all these trees are just in one, uh, one section of the island. And so that, that raises some questions of why are they there? So to address that, we, we create some demography plots and scatter them throughout the, the, the stand. So many of these plots are within the forest and many of them are, are outside the boundary to see uh, what they might encroach there. Also, we wanted to compare this to the, to the mainland population. We actually don't, prior to this point, we had no idea how they compared. And so uh, part of the study was just to see how did the age ranges compare uh, between the two populations. And what, what does the management have to do with these populations? So this is the, the map that we were able to produce at, after the end of uh, 2000, the summer of 2014. The red dots, represent trees that are larger than 60 centimeters diameter. So that'd be a tree, if you were to hug it, it'd be something about, about this size. Versus all the yellow dots are trees younger than that. And you can say uh, a bigger tree is an older tree, right? And later on, I'll, I'll touch on that aspect, how we know uh, within a, a small envelope of how old a tree is safely. And so these red dots represent trees that grew decades ago. So you can essentially look back in time, where were these Torrey Pines? say 50 years ago. And so that's where, the, that's where these red dots represent. And so you can see the trees are expanding on, on the edges of the, of the, the red dots. So these are the demography plots. We scattered these throughout the stand uh, to, to understand seedling survival, the, the type of habitat where these trees are growing. And so several of these uh, demography plots have actually uh, very few toward pine, and some of them have, have zero. So we want to see how, how long does it take to get the trees to spread there, if they are spreading. So, the, for example, the top one, the top green square, has zero trees in it. But then if you go back, you can see some of these, I'm trying, I don't miss it up. But some of these dots are very, very far away from any tree that has a home. So, some of these are, are very, very far away from any tree that has a home. So there's something just um, moving these seeds around. So there's, there's the common raven, Corvus corax, and also deer mice that move some of these seeds around. Those, those are some of the, the factors of uh, doing seed migration. So in the plot demography, we set up these plots. And this is, this is a, a picture of one in the very center of the stand. There's around a foot of dead pine needles all throughout the stand, which is not 
very good habitat for seedlings to grow. And so in the center of the sand, we had very, very little of these, of these seedlings growing. Over our, our, our total plots, which is 45, we had 329 trees to mark, in the, uh, to mark their, their height, their health, and uh, we came back in March. So that was July, we came back in March of the, of the following year to see how much they had grown. So the, the demography results, uh, the, it was a surprising number of the seedlings survived after a year. This was in the fourth year of drought. So 71% survived, which was comparable to a study done on the mainland. So you can say they compared there. And they, they also grew uh, a, a considerable amount, so around three centimeters, which is also consistent with what they found at Party Pine State Natural Reserve. We also increased, there was 28 new seedlings throughout all these, uh, all these plots. And as far as survival goes, all the, the trees that died were these seedlings. It seems that if, they could, if the seedlings could, or if the Tory pines could survive beyond the seedling stage, they're set. So that, that might be the, the toughest part of their life history is just the seedling stage. And so I said, uh, uh, bigger trees and older trees. So we, we found that out by coring trees. We've all seen uh, a log that's cut in half. You see the tree rings growing there. So by coring the trees, we're able to figure out how old that tree is without destroying the tree. And so we cored 19 trees and uh, produced a regression line. And so uh, we had a very consistent pattern. It's a very helpful formula. And so we can plug in how big the tree is. So I said a 60 um, centimeter tree is 50 years old. The reason I came up with that number is by using this formula. And so going back to the big map, we, we have all the, the measurements of these trees. We can see, figure out where's the biggest tree, where's the oldest tree. So these are the census results. Previous estimations said there was around 2,000 trees in the island. We were surprised to find 24,000 trees. So I had, I had a bigger project than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> some, some striking things about this, I bolded it. There's, there's a, a similar amount of reproductive trees, uh, trees that are above 160 centimeters with cones. They both have, a, uh, the mainland population has just under 4,000. We have a little over 3,000. It's a considerable amount. But then if you look at the other size classes, uh, the island is packed with these younger age classes. And so 80% of the island is shorter than my arm right here. And they're very, very striking. Versus on the mainland, it's the flip. 80% are, are adults. And this ties in with uh, the, the parks management of the island. Well, so this is just a, a graphical re representation of the population comparison. These aren't, these aren't numbers, these are just percentages of the population. So if you add up these two, you get 80% less than this height. And then just by this one itself with the, the mainland, 80% are adults. So you can think of the island as being a nursery and the mainland population being a nursing home. So there's not, there's not a lot of growth going on. So combining the data that we had of the trees as far as their size with the, the dates the park started removing these animals, we can sort of look back in time and see what was the result of each species being removed. Our biggest tree was 116 centimeters right here. If you plug that into my formula, that means it started life probably around 1890, within 20%. Within, uh, 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 the island had uh, sheep introduced in the 1840s. It had cattle, deer, uh, mule deer, Roosevelt elk, and feral pigs, all introduced to the island. And these started being re removed uh, later on. And so you can see these dates when they were removed. And so in 1993, we have the, the, the pigs removed. There's not a huge jump in the, in the size classes. 1998, we have the, the cattle removed. Not a huge jump. The biggest jump is 2011. And please notice this break right here. That number is 20,000. There'd be no way to represent that graphically. You would have to take off the roof and it'd be somewhere up, up there. But the, huge, the biggest break happened is 2011 when, the, when the, the mule deer and elk are removed. That's, that's what gave rise to 20,000 of these, of these trees popping up. And so by, by, again, plugging that into my formula, we find 80% of these trees are less than six years old as of, or less than five years old as of 2014. So that means a lot of these trees began their life around 2009. 
And 2011 was, was the official year that the, the very last of these animals were removed. So you could say up to that point, there's just a few. So the, the biggest population boom began as most of these animals were removed. So we know the status of the Torrey, uh, Santa Rosa Island Torrey Pine. There's a large number than previously estimated. Uh, majority of the species is on the island versus the mainland, contrary to what was previously thought. And this actually shows uh, successes um, as far as removing invasive animals. And this is just one example of the, the many species that have benefited from uh, intervention in removing some of these animals. And this is just a picture showing from 1999 to 2012. I did not put this in black and white to show how old this was. That was just the way the photograph was given to me. I'm not trying to, to deceive you all. And you can just see how the trees are expand, are moving down the hill. The, the main stem is not, uh, uh, that was at the main area of growth. The, as, as I was showing the map, the main edge of, the main area of growth is on the edges where there's uh, enough shade but also sunlight. Not a lot's growing in the main stem because it's too much shade. And so they need a proper amount of uh, sunlight, moisture, and shade, enough protection. So this is mainly happening on the boundaries of the stand. Are, are there any questions? Let's see in my, yeah, go for it. That's a nice correlation with the sudden increase in the number of young trees with cessation of grazing. But it's similar, a uh, similar sprouting of young ones at Toy Pines too. Well, I would almost disagree with the amount of uh, recruits here. It looks like it's way bigger. Oh, there's a thousand there. But if you start adding these size classes together, these big ones start to quickly dominate the smaller ones. The, the biggest increase the, the mainland population has had was probably in the, the 80s when there, was a, uh, when there was a fire there. It killed 94 adults but gave rise to 212 seedlings in a good study. So that disturbance actually benefited it. And one of the reasons I believe the, the park also benefited, so the animals could have been a two-edged sword. The animals could have been gra grazing the, uh, the torrid pines, but also they're eating other vegetation. That could give rise to open up more habitat for these, for these trees. And so disturbance seemed to help the island, uh, and also removing them, of course, so they can continue to grow. And the same thing with the, with the, uh, the main population. Having the bark beetle uh, go through there, the park, cleared out many of these older trees, and now the canopy's opened up, so some of these seedlings could pop up and replace these, these older trees in a, in, a, in a higher density. So not just one seedling replacing one adult, maybe four or five replacing an adult, because the such a bigger can canopy's open. Yeah. So I was um, looking at soil compaction between the two sites. Uh, I know there's a lot of foot traffic around the Torrey Pine site. Yeah. Uh, the ground is still really hard when you walk around there. Yeah, yeah. I, I went there in 2012, long before I knew I was going to do this study. But you're right, the, the, the common trails are essentially a parking lot. There, there's, there's almost no chance of vegetation growing through there. That may be a, a, a huge factor as far as uh, the difference between, between the two. The, the soil on, on the island is very, very sandy and not compacted. And like I said, there's a lot of dust from pine, uh, pine needles and other vegetation. So that could be, that could be a huge part of the difference there. Did you do a genetic uh, difference between the trees? I, I did not, no. Um, I read some uh, some papers on that in the beginning of my research. They're, they're very similar. Um, a lot of the, the genetic uh, terminology used just went right, right over my head. But um, uh, some of the papers read that they might probably split around 3,000 years ago from a common ancestor. So either um, the, the seeds were introduced by the island by, by Native Americans or by, by an animal. And so that, that's what the literature said again. Thank you.